Okay, so it's 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 a great pleasure to have um, Tatsuma Nishioka um, from the Yukawa Institute um, talking to us today um, about the about his recent paper on the capacity of entanglement, and in particular probing Hawking radiation using the capacity of entanglement. Thanks, Tatsuma. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank Jeff for giving me this opportunity of the talk. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about my recent papers, um, so these two, and uh, these are uh, uh, based on collaboration with two students, Koki Kawabata and uh, Yoshitaka Okuyama, who uh, both of them are uh, in the University of Tokyo, and also uh, with Kent Watanabe, his uh, postdoc now in UC Davis. So today I'm going to talk about the um, the two topics. So one is just uh, Hawking radiation, and the other one is uh, capacity of entanglement. So which may be uh, not so familiar to most of you. So so this is the plan of my talk. So first, I'd like to review the, the so-called information paradox, and uh, also uh, related to the Hawking radiation uh, in the presence of the black hole. And I will briefly review uh, the capacity and time in, uh, as a quantum equation. And then I will move on to derive a so called, uh, yeah, what we call capacity formula uh, in two, two dimensional Dirichlet gravity. And uh, I, I will give you some examples of the uh, capacity of entanglement in some toy model of uh, black hole. Okay. So let me uh, briefly review about the Hawking radiation and the uh, information paradox. So uh, let, let's start with a uh, thinking about some pure states. Uh, okay, so let's suppose that you have uh, some matter, a coll collapsing matter as an initial state, uh, which is pure. This is assumption, and uh, you, you let them collapse uh, by a gravitational force. Then eventually it, it becomes a black hole. So this is a Penrose diagram of the collapsing uh, matter and which becomes black hole at some point. So after uh, horizon, okay, after uh, becoming a black hole, so the black hole starts uh, evaporating and uh, because of the Hawking radiation around quantum matter, okay? So Hawking radiation, uh, so due to the Hawking radiation, black hole starts to evaporate, and then it becomes uh, yeah, starting shrinking, starts shrinking, and in the end, the so black hole completely evaporates. So after the complete, evapor yeah, complete evaporation of the black hole, the system becomes in the mixed state of the thermal radiation. So you, you only uh, you are only left with Hawking radiation. So even if you start with pure state. After the black hole evaporation, so you end up with a mixed, completely mixed state, which is fixed by as a mass of the black hole. So, so this is a paradox because, okay, if uh, the Hawking radiation, sorry, uh, black hole evaporation process is unitary, then pure state can, cannot be a mixed state. So this is a paradox. So this is a famous information loss problem. Um, Close to my Hawking. So, uh, so this is a long-standing problem. And but okay, so to yeah, to make it more uh, concrete, so Don Page uh, come up with some mo model of an evaporating black hole using some quantum mechanical system. So let's suppose that okay, our initial state, this is pure state, uh, can be bipartite in this way. So. So, so there are two systems. So one is a black hole system and the other one is a radiation system. So this part uh, describes the black hole, black hole part and the radiation system correspond to the Hawking radiation. Uh, yeah, radiation particles. So the, this side is supposed to be a pure. And uh, page show that if Okay, if you uh, unitary evolve this state, then so you can consider so-called entanglement entropy for the radiation system. So basically you, you observe Hawking radiation by collecting particles and you compute the entanglement entropy. So this is the SR. 
Same, when the dimension of the radiation system is much, much smaller than the black hole system. So namely, the black hole start evaporating. And this is the early time stage. Then the radiation system is almost maximally entangled with the black hole system. So the entanglement entropy is given by uh, the log of the dimension of the radiation system. So okay, if you plot the entanglement entropy of the radiation system with respect to time, so t, which is defined by log of the dimension of the radiation system, so then it linearly grows like this. So uh, okay, if you use the Hawking, uh, the original calculation, you only uh, you can only reproduce this linear growth. But he showed that okay, if the system evolves linearly, then at some point this curve must uh, degrees at some point actually at time called page time. Because okay, you, you can use the same, same argument just by uh, predicting the role of the radiation system and the whole system. Okay, namely, so when the radiation, the radiation system becomes well, much, much larger than the black hole system, then you can flip the rows of these two. So then the entropy is now so given by log of the dimension of the black hole system. But, the, the, but this dimension is can be replaced by the dimension of the uh, total river space minus dimension of the radiation system. And of course, we are fixing the dimension of the total system. So, so this means that the entropy is decreasing at some point. Okay. This, this part is from the decrease of the entropy at later time. So according to this stages uh, argument, so Entanglement entropy on the Hawking radiation must yeah, be, uh, grow linearly at first, but at some point it should go, yeah, go decreasing. So this is a sort of page curve. So to reproduce this page curve is one of the biggest problems um, to resolve the information paradox problem. Okay, so recently uh, many, many uh, developments uh, which resolve the information loss problem. So the, the idea is uh, actually uh, very simple. So to reconcile with the page curve, so we want to reproduce the page curve somehow yeah. using just semi-classical. Uh, so then, the, okay, basically, yeah, these, these so the island one, so we, Okay, so this form is okay. okay. Now you are interested in the, the entropy of the radiation system in radiation. So to, to measure in radiation, so we prepare some radiation Now we are supposed to measure the radiation to the entanglement entropy across this region. But if, uh, even if you are interested in the entanglement entry, so you need to, yeah, you need to include the so called the island region. So this region is and you, you first um, um, oh, Sorry, that's uh, you, You're breaking up quite a lot. I don't know if it's just me. Um, let me see. Um, oh, okay. Mpo, can, can you hear, hear clearly or? It's, it's yeah, speaking. I was about to ask about it also. Okay. Let me see. Okay, so, okay, so let, let me, okay. Let me restart from this page. Okay, so uh, the to reconcile with the page curve, so the entropy of radiation should be calculated by using so-called the island formula. So basically, so you are supposed to calculate the, the entropy of the Hawking radiation 
through, uh, through this region, sigma r. But uh, OK, so this formula tells us that you need to include some region called island in your computation. So th this is kind of virtual region, uh, uh, yeah, which appears in this formula. And you first uh, kind of yeah, assume that there exists some interval inside the black hole. And then, so you calculate the area of the, this region, and you also calculate the entanglement entropy of the matter for, uh, for the union of uh, the original um, radiation region plus island region. And then, so you are supposed to extremize with respect to this island region and take a minimum. So this is a formula. So, um, okay, de depending on the configuration, so this region yeah, may vanish, namely, so th this region shrinks and uh, to the point, then, so it corresponds to the no island configuration. So then, so without the island, then, so you can reproduce the, the linear, linear growth at RA time. But on the other hand, once you include the island region, so you actually, yeah, you can, yeah, successfully reproduce the the saturation or uh, the degrees of, of the uh, the entanglement entropy at late time. So including island is very important to resolve the information loss problem. So this is the recent development. And uh, okay, so this is a review of the information loss problem. Okay, actually, so the island formula. Uh, can be proved um, in some special cases, like in two dimension, by using so-called gravitational path integral. So the idea is very similar to uh, the derivation of the so-called Ryuta-Kainagi formula. So Ryuta-Kainagi formula uh, tells us how to calculate the entanglement entropy holographically. But actually, so uh, using the, the gravitational path integral, so this formula, so Ryuta-Kainagi formula can be also uh, in, in the context of a, a safety correspondence. So the island formula actually uh, is a um, generalization of the Ryuta kinetic formula because, okay, maybe you, you notice that uh, this part exactly looks like a Ryuta kinetic formula. And uh, this is a quantum uh, kind of correction from the matter field. So uh, the formula is uh, actually uh, can be regarded as a generalization of the RT formula. And, and in some setup, so the island formula can be derived using the gravitational path integral in the same way as the RT formula. So basically, so you use so-called replica trick to, uh, to derive the, the island formula. So then the island region actually appears as a, um, the throat of the so-called replica wormhole. So in the replica calculation, so you uh, you prepare, say, n copies of, of the, say, original space time. So in this case, I, I have two copies. And uh, you, you calculate the gravitational passing integral on, on, the, on these uh, replicated geometries. Then, so because now, so you, you have a gravity inside the bulk, okay, inside these regions. So then you, you need to take into account so-called replica wormholes which connects uh, between these two copies. So then, so this island region actually, actually appears as a uh, throat of the replica armholes. Okay, so, so this is very good. And, but okay, actually the, the, the formula, the, the island formula is proven only in very special cases at this moment. Okay, so the, okay, here is the goal of my talk. Okay, so, so in this talk, so I want to yeah, Sorry, can I, can examine the... Sure. Um, if you go back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everywhere else that we, that we encounter the replica trick in entanglement entropy and disordered systems, et cetera, mm -hmm. it's always just a trick, right? It's a, it's a, it's a way of computing yeah. something um, and it really relies on this n to zero limit um, uh, when you want to calculate it. 
Um, and in some cases, it, you know, that that limit is well. In most cases, I don't know that there's a that there's a formal derivation of the well. Let me put it this way: I don't know that there's a formal proof that the replica trick is trustworthy all the time. In fact, this 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 method of effort of in uh, in, in, in disordered systems where you can, where instead of using the replica trick, you use the, the you use Grassmann variables instead to compute the, the partition function is, is specifically used because you know, people in that community didn't believe the replica trick held everywhere. Is there some physics that we're now anchoring to the replica trick? Or is this still just a computational trick? Schemes. Um, I think yeah. At this moment, yeah, it's just a trick. So a yeah, computational trick. So we just yeah believe that uh, it gives the correct physically sensible answer. Obviously, right. yeah, there are many issues like uh, analytic continuation problems. Right. Right. So in a question, so you start with preparing n copies of say space times, but the n is supposed to be a positive integer. Mm -hmm. But we naively analytically continue it to n goes to one. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just, it's just uh, yeah, well, everything is kind of assumptions. <laughs> and uh, you know, once you get the, the result, the, and if it is sensible, so you just believe the result is correct. But uh, I, I, yeah, to my best knowledge, uh, there is no, well, yeah, no, no rigorous say, proof why replicative works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can you please go back to the Allen formula equation. Mm -hmm. And on the slide with the equation. Oh, okay. Did this one? Yes, I wanted to ask on the on the equation on the boundary of the of the Island region, is there a divergence there? Divergence? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, oh uh, I see. Okay. Uh, okay, so th th there are uh, several divergences. Okay, this, this is actually, um, let me see. So this one has G Newton here. So this one is kind of finite as long as it is finite region, so the area is finite. But on the other hand, so the matter part has UV divergence. Oh. So yes, but uh, okay, so this G Newton is um, the bare coupling in gravity, gravity theory. So the UV divergence, uh, yeah, which comes from the matter part, can be renormalized by redefining the G Newton appropriately. So this is actually yeah, how yeah how the semi semi classical analysis works. So even if the matter part has UV divergence, you can always cancel such UV divergence just by tuning the background Newton constant. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any any question? Okay. If not, okay. So let, let me let me move on. So in my talk, okay, so this is a, the, just a, a kind of summary of my talk. Uh, okay, so, so basically, so I'm going to examine the Hogging radiation, um, but just by, not by using ion formula, but uh, using so-called capacitive entanglement. So this is a quantum information measure, uh, which is different from entanglement entropy. So entanglement entropy is uh, one of the quantum information measures. But uh, there are uh, uh, many, many quantum information measures. And actually, uh, this capacitive entanglement is a kind of nice measure, but uh, the whose property is not so uh, well investigated so far. So I'd like to uh, yeah, examine yeah, how capacity is useful in this context. And I'm going to derive a similar formula, uh, a formula for the capacity, which is very similar to the island formula in two-dimensional Dirichlet gravity. And I will calculate the capacity uh, in the toy model of radiating black holes to get some insights. 
And uh, the, my, my conclusion, yeah, is that my main, main message is that the capacity is typically have a peak or discontinuity at the page time, so which shows that uh, yeah, capacity can be a good probe of the Hawking radiation or the, uh, the probe of the, um, the formation of the replica wormhole. So this is the main point. Okay, so let me move on to the, the second part. Okay, so let me briefly remind you how you calculate the entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. So typically, so you are um, supposed to calculate the entropy for a given region A. So, so we assume that, okay, so once you fix the time slice, then so you have uh, some Hilbert space, so H total. And you assume that the, the Hilbert space can be decomposed in this way. So HA tensor HB, so this is the assumption. So then, so you can define entanglement entropy associated with this region by defining the so the reduced entry matrix. So basically, so you are only interested in uh, in the, the observation uh, in this region. So which means that you you completely ignore all the information about P. So this is uh, so what you mean by ignoring. So you completely take a trace respect to the region B, so then you only left with some density matrix, which completely describes everything happen, happens inside the region A. So for simplicity, let me start with a pure ground state. So suppose that the, the total Hilbert space is pure, okay? So then and the entanglement entropy can be calculated using so-called a replica trick. So this is a trick, but uh, there is a, in, in this case, there is some kind of physical or yeah, some reasonable, um, yeah, the reason why you, you want to use a replica trick. Because, okay, replica trick amounts to just calculating so-called the Rennie entropy. So the Rennie entropy is a one parameter generalization of the entanglement entropy. So which is defined by this in this way. So you first take a, a trace of the row A to the N, so N is power of the resistance entry matrix. And then the Rennie entropy calculated in this way. And if you analytically continue with, with respect to N, th then so in N goes to one limit, you, you get the entanglement entropy. So then, so in the field theory, so the Rennie entropy can be calculated uh, by just using the passing integral on so-called the, the n-fold cover of the original space-time. So here, here is the region A. And uh, so n-fold cover means that, uh, okay, even, even though you are only interested in the, in, uh, the entanglement entropy of, of such a, okay, such a region, so you need to prepare n copies of your theory. And you, you glue them together cyclically. So this is so-called the n-fold cover. And once you know the path integral on such a cover, and then so you can get the Rennie entropy. So this is a trick. Okay, so, so this is the entanglement entropy or Rennie entropy. But once you regard the partition function on the n-fold cover as a thermal partition function at, the, at an inverse temperature, beta equal to n, so then uh, you can actually define um, analogous quantities to statistical, mechanical, uh, statistical mechanics. So namely, in statistical mechanics, you have temperature, Hamiltonian, partial fraction, and free energy, and et cetera. But uh, you, you have a, um, an analogy to the thermodynamic quantities um, uh, for the Rennie entropies. So namely, so now you, identify beta in bus temperature as a parameter n, and you identify Hamiltonian as a minus log of rho a. So then, so this one. So Zn is a partial function on the n-fold cover, but it is defined as a trace of the n power of rho a. So, so once you define the Hamiltonian in this way, this Zn can be written as a 
trace of e to the minus beta HA. Okay. So this is uh, something like a Hamiltonian. Of, of course, yeah, in general, this HA is not a local. Even if you start with a local uh, system, like a spin, spin chain with nearest neighbor interaction, so once you take a trace, partial trace, respect to the region B, so HA is no longer local. But this is a, just a formal analogy. Okay, you can define some Hamiltonian describing your system. Sorry, can I just check? So is once that, you is that the same as the modular Hamiltonian? This is modular Hamiltonian. Yes, right. this is okay. so-called modular. Hamiltonian. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. So once you introduce so-called modular Hamiltonian, the the partial function on the n-fold cover can be written as a um, partial function for some some system with Hamiltonian HA. So then you can define uh, free energy, energy and thermal entropy, and also heat capacity in the same way as uh, as in the statistical mechanics. Sorry. So free energy is. Yes. Can I can I can I just, just ask? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I should I should say part of the reason that we don't have time limit on the on the talk is because we ask a lot of questions in the talk. Um, um, so 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 let me see if I understand. If I if I take if I take a Hamiltonian for a system, then I can I can go ahead and set up an entire machinery for statistical mechanics with that Hamiltonian, right? Compute the partition yes. function from the partition function, all the thermodynamic quantities. Okay, so you're you're saying that the analogy that you're writing down is as long as we 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 take uh, an analytic continuation of n um, and mm -hmm. identify that with beta and identify the modular Hamiltonian with the Hamiltonian of the system, I could do exactly the same thing for for this for this modular system if you want. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is a formal analogy. So now, so we want to regard this, yeah, this partial function as a kind of, yeah, analogous partial, thermal partial function. So with some fictitious Hamiltonian. And we, we just define um, the thermodynamic qualities with respect to this beta and this Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is free energy, this is energy. And this is the thermal entropy. So I, I put tilde uh, because, okay, this S tilde is okay, not library, so you expect that this S tilde would correspond to the rainy entropy, which I introduced in the last slides. But this is actually not <laughs> equal to Sn, but they, they are related to each other. And you can define the heat capacity uh, in a canonical way. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's see more uh, closely. So okay, the thermal entropy I define is not e exactly equal to the Renyi entropy because Sn is defined in this way. So this can be rewritten uh, using the free energy like this, but this is not equal to uh, the canonical definition of the thermal entropy. So this is the canonical definition of the uh, yes the thermal entropy. This is these two are different. So, but instead, okay, so S tilde, uh, uh, which I define this way, uh, can be called, say, refi refined one, refined entropy, or sometimes called improved Rennie or modular entropy. So, whatever you call. But anyway, so th these two are actually one to one correspondence uh, to each other. So, SN tilde can be written in this way using the original Rennie entropy. But the, the point of interest is that the capacity of entanglement can also be written just using the modular Hamiltonian in this way. So this is just uh, the variance of the modular Hamiltonian. So it is clear that in unitary theory, so this variance is always non-negative. Okay, so here, so the expectation value is defined in this way. So the capacity of entanglement uh, is supposed to be non-negative, and this is uh, clearly a different quantity to the, the original entropy. So this this measures the variance of the system, and this was originally introduced by Yao and Qi. 
But uh, yeah, so far, to my best knowledge, so this quantity is not so well understood. So I, uh, I'd like to, yeah, use it in, in, to probe the Hawking radiation. Okay, so next, let me move on to the third part. Okay, so now, so I'd like to focus on 2D gravity, zero gravity coupled to large C, C conformal field theory. So this system is very nice because you can mostly do the uh, exact calculations, especially you can derive the, the, the island formula in this setup. Okay, so this system is just consists of uh, two parts. So one is the Einstein gravity. So Einstein term in two dimension is actually topological because in two dimension, the integral of the rich scalar uh, this is uh, actually the topological invariant. So, and, but if the, the manifold has a boundary, so you need to add a, um, the boundary term. So this is the extrinsic curvature at the uh, boundary. So, but, but here, so uh, you can write this Einstein term just using the Euler number. So this is Euler number. Euler invariant, maybe. So this is a, a proportion to the Euler uh, number of this two-dimensional surface. So the, the second part is uh, comes from the Dirichlet term. So Dirichlet term actually it gives you uh, some constraints. So namely, so okay, without this term, so the theory only depends on the topology of your space-time. So space-time is just a two-dimensional uh, some surface. But uh, now we want to have some a constraint. So the Dirichlet term uh, just acts as a constraint because okay, phi. So the Dirichlet is phi. Phi mul multiplies this guy. So so equation motion for phi gives you that uh, a constraint. So this term must vanish. So this is a constraint imposed on this theory, and this is also the similar boundary term. Okay, so in, in the case of JT gravity on ADS2, so we we just set, okay, set u, u equal to zero and v equal to two. Then, so you get a constraint r plus two equal to zero. So, so which means that r is equal to minus two. So this is gives you ADS2 space time. So with negative curvature. Okay, so this is a, a kind of uh, yes. Um, sorry again. Um, is that is that is that constraint statement true in in general? Because I mean, if I've got if I've got derivative terms in in inside the square bracket in I dilaton, surely those contribute mm -hmm. in the variation. So in the mm -hmm. J, in the uh, case. Oh yeah 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 yeah. You, you mean this this part? Yes. I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood the point, but uh, yeah, so typically so this part becomes a constraint, and uh, this is a kind of general form of the Dirichlet gravity up to two derivative. So maybe I, my, what what I say is just applied only for say simple cases like the JT gravity. Yeah, I this, think this, for, this for JT gravity, it's definitely true. Yeah. yeah, 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 and, and right. possibly for CGHS as well. Oh, possibly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Maybe I, I misunderstood this point, but uh, yes. Typically, so the, this Dilaton does not have any dynamical information, but it only gives rise to constraint, at least in simple models of gravity, so like a JT. Okay, actually, yeah, I'm going to only use the JT gravity in the following, so maybe, yeah, this point doesn't matter. So now, okay, I, I like to apply the Rebecca calculation using gravitational path integral. So this, uh, I, I only just follow, naively follow the Lukowitz Marvacena uh, prescription. So, so to apply the Rebecca trick, so you, you first uh, set up Rebecca geometry. So, uh, uh, okay, okay, I, I, on, I explained about the Rebecca trick in quantum field theory without gravity, but uh, the story doesn't change even in the presence of gravity. So you basically prepare the end copies. So end copies of uh, space time. 
which are glued cyclically. So you have end copies. So this is the end fold cover. So M and tilde. So this is the cover. But uh, okay, so now, okay, the, the very important point uh, of, of their argument is that, okay, once you have a turn on the gravity, okay, basically, so e, okay, to glue each copies, each copy to each other, uh, you have a branch cut, okay? So, so you, you glue, glue along these branch cut to make a, a end fold cover. So, which means that you have some singularity in, in your space time. And uh, here, so in the blue region, so you have gravity. But if you have gr gravity, then this singularity uh, must be smooth. So there, there must be no singularity in gravity region because gravity dynamically chooses uh, the, uh, their configuration, space-time configuration. So on the other hand, without gravity, so this singularity remains. So, um, okay, after changing the coordinate, so you end up with something like this. So this is still the end fold cover. Okay, originally, so you have say uh, some periodicity beta along this circle, but uh, if you go to the okay this picture, so okay so you, you glue n copies of them, so you the periodicity becomes n times beta, and in the gravity region, so there is no singularity. So, okay, actually I think uh, we should still have singularity. On, on this point, okay, but I which I know uh, right explicitly. This is the cover picture, but you can go to the all before the picture by just take a quotient by uh, Zn. So Z, because they, they are they have Zn symmetry. So you, we glue these in copies cyclically, so you can take a quotient. So then after uh, taking the orbifold, the Zn quotient, then conical singularity appears even in the, uh, the gravity region, okay? On the cover, so there is no singularity, but after the quotient, so there appears a singularity here. Okay. So there are two pictures, so they, they are equivalent. So now, so okay, let's, let's uh, implement these two idea, these ideas uh, in the gravitational fast integral calculation. So now we are interested in calculating uh, the, the on shell action okay, because we want to calculate the parachute function. So we, we want to calculate the on shell action on these geometries. So then, so okay, actually uh, using the orbital is actually very uh, convenient uh, in, in the following way. So first, we, we, we basically want to calculate. Uh, the on shell action on the original n fold cover. So M and tilde is a cover. Okay, so this is M and tilde. And we want to calculate the on shell partial function. So on shell partial function uh, is equal to the log of minus log of the uh, uh, log of z. Okay. But uh, once you move to the orbifold, then uh, the one over n times on shell action. On the on the cover is equal to the on shell action of the orbifold. Okay, so not really, yeah, you you would say that okay, okay. you you would understand this part, okay, because uh, the orbifold has uh, yeah one over n times the on shell action of the original cover because the volume of the the, the orbifold is yeah n times smaller than the cover. So you may understand this part, but actually, so there, there is an additional contribution which comes from the singularity in the gravity region. So you need to take into account the, the singularity contribution on the orbital. So then, so, okay, you end up with this equality. So basically, so this is, so the left-hand side is what we want to calculate. And the right-hand side, is uh, uh, the on shell action on the orbital plus some localized contribution coming from singularity. So this is called the area term. So in, in the case of say JT or some two dimensional simple gra uh, gravity, then the area term is given by 
S0, this is just a parameter which multiplies the Euler number, so Einstein term, plus uh, the Dilaton, Dilaton term, but which is evaluated on the conical singularity in the gravity region. So this is the localized term. So in the semi-classical limit, so we assume that uh, one over G Newton is much, much larger than the central charge. So which means that we neglect the back reaction from the CFT, but the CFT um, is still uh, has a very large number. Sorry, Tatma, I think your slides yeah. are not synced anymore. Um, oh, oh, I see. Oh, what's what's? We happening? are still seeing slide sixteen. Sure. Yeah, now I realize that. Um, this is weird. So, so let, let me let me stop the sharing first and uh, check if it, it works. So can you see? Yeah. Now this is slide seventeen. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. It's working. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about about that. Ah. So okay. So uh, let, let me let me start with this page from this page. Okay. So basically, we want to uh, calculate the on action on the on the cover. And uh, but we have this identity, so the right hand side is evaluated on on the output. But on the output, we have additional contribution coming from singularity, and this is the area term. So area term includes S naught. So this comes from the Einstein Hilbert action, and this is the the, the value of the Dilaton on the conical singularities. And in the, in the semi classical limit, so you can calculate log of the trace uh, row to the n. And this is equal to, this is equal to the, uh, yeah, this one, one over n times the onshare action on the cover. And you also have a, a similar contribution from the CFT. But you can use this identity to rewrite, uh, rewrite it, it in this way. So then this form is actually uh, nice uh, when you calculate a, the Rényi entropy or entanglement entropy. So, so you, you just substitute a, the previous equation into this definition. And after taking n goes to one limit, so you end up with a, the area term, okay, island formula, so which consists of the area term plus uh, CFT entanglement entropy. Okay, so you just only, uh, okay, this term only remains. Okay, th these two terms remains. This term actually uh, vanishes after taking n go to one limit. And you, you can similarly uh, perform the, uh, the calculation for the capacity as well. So just by taking one more derivative. So then, okay, roughly speaking, so you just take a derivative uh, of this Dilaton term. So then so you end up with the capacity. So this term uh, becomes the, this one. And the entropy is now replaced by the capacity of the matter. So this is uh, what we get. This is the formula. Actually, so compared to the island formula, um, the capacity, for, capacity is, um, uh, is more complicated in the sense that it involves the derivative of the Dilaton with respect to the replica parameter n. Okay, so in the island formula, so there is no n dependence and everything can be uh, calculated without knowing the re replica geometry explicitly. But on the other hand, so the capacity formula includes the derivative of the Dilaton with respect to n. So uh, you have to um, know the, the, the geometry, the re replica geometry with uh, n not equal to one okay, to calculate this guy. So even, even though we take uh, n goes to one limit, this is a huge difference. But we can uh, get some um, implications from this formula. OK. Oh, by the way, so let, let me make a few comments about our formula. Okay, to calculate the capacity, uh, we first uh, need to fix 
we need to first solve the so-called QES condition, quantum extremal surface condition, so which fixes the position of the, the island. So basically, you, you extremize the entanglement entropy. So this is the entanglement entropy. But, but uh, okay, you first uh, suppose that the, the island is here or here, there, and by, by just changing the location of the island. But you, you need to extremize uh, the entanglement entropy with respect to the position. Uh, and this is how you fix the position of the island. And once you fix the position of the island, you can evaluate our capacity. Okay, so here, so we have also have WI, but this WI is fixed by just uh, using island formula. Okay, so this is just uh, one comment. And okay, the second point is that, uh, okay, so entropy is automatically continuous at the page time because we are supposed to take the least configuration of the entropy. So namely, so if you have two, two configurations, one is with island and the other one is say no island, then so they, 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 may, they may compete compete with each other. But the, the island formula tells us that, uh, okay, we should take uh, the smaller, okay, the, the configuration with smaller en entropy. So at the page time, so they switch and, uh, but at the page time, the difference of their entropy is automatically zero, okay? But that's why you, you get the page cup like this, or, or like this. But on the other hand, the capacity uh, does not necessarily vanish at the page time. Okay, so this is the difference of the capacity. So this, this guy is not necessarily uh, zero at the page time. Okay, there is no reason to expect that it vanishes. So typically, so we expect that the capacity it shows some discontinuity. So it jumps at the page time. So this is uh, one implication uh, from the, our formula. So, but unfortunately, sorry, so this formula is quite... Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Can, can I just ask uh, uh, another question on that point? Sure, sure. sure. Um, is, there, is there some intuitive way to understand the capacity for entanglement? Um, maybe in some finite dimensional system um, that one can picture, um, and and if so, is the state? I mean, from the from the name and from a from a reading of your paper, um, or or a brief reading of your paper, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of understand that the capacity of entanglement is like the name says, the the ability of a of a system to get entangled, um, in in some sense. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in which case, this discontinuity can 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 one understand this in some sort of phase transition or? Yes, yes, yes. It, this exactly, yeah, proves the phase transition. So okay, yeah, you, you, okay. So in, in some dynamics, so there are um, several types of phase transition: first order, second order, etc. And uh, typically, so the. Okay, I, I don't remember the convention, but okay. if you see the phase transition, okay, sometimes the entropy is continuous, but the capacity can be divergent at the fixed, uh, okay, at the, the phase transition point. Mm -hmm. So this is S and this is C. And, and uh, now, now what we claim is very similar to the just the ordinary sum dynamic system. So in, in the case of the uh, Hawking radiation, so this may, may be called maybe first order, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the derivative of S, okay. S is continuous, but the capacity, the derivative is not continuous. Right. So in this case, maybe this is called first order, uh, yeah. Right, so yeah, that's that would be a first order transition in the... Mm -hmm. But of course, this is an analogy, but... Uh, yeah, basically, so that this okay, capacity improves some fluctuation around the around the phase transition. Yeah? So mm -hmm. this proves fluctuation because it's it's measures the variation of the Hamiltonian. Right. So it's it's typically yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, typically it, it's this 
it shows discontinuity at the phase transition point. Well, okay, I guess, I, I'm going to give you I guess more since, um, pages. Uh, and I guess mm -hmm. since pages um, uh, computation was done for a, for a relatively generic quantum system, this is a statement that should hold for any system in which I can identify some modular Hamiltonian, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Actually, yeah. I, I'm. I'm. I'm going to show you that. Okay. So I here I say that, that the capacity to show this continuity, but that this is actually true only for a system. We okay. This is kind of approximation. So here, so we make a, some very good appro approximation, namely, so the page cap. Okay. We we draw the page cap. Uh, in, uh, okay. Previously, but this is the early time and only late time behavior. So if you look at the page uh, uh, curve closely, so near the page transition point, then uh, actually there are more and more um, contributions from Rebecca wormholes. So once you include such a, uh, corrections, then the page curve becomes more smooth. So, okay. So if you just draw the early time curve and late time curve, and they close at some point here, and you see some sharp transition. But if you include the more quantum corrections near, near the, this point, then the curve becomes smoother and smoother. So typically, the capacity becomes, uh, okay, it shows uh, not a discontinuity, but a kind of crossover or peak once you include uh, the quantum corrections. Okay, here we, we, we just compare two, two dominant saddles, but there are more saddles coming from, from the river clam holes. Okay, I'm gonna show, show you uh, examples uh, in very concrete setup. So can, can you proceed? Can, can I proceed? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, great, okay. Okay, so, so okay, this is the imp one implication uh, from our formula, and actually, uh, we want okay, we can confirm this um, yeah our speculation in very concrete setup. Okay, using the toy model of Hawking radiation. So this model is very uh, simple. So this is called the end of the world brain model um, studied by these gentlemen. So the, the basic idea is very similar to the page argument, but the here, so we basically model the radiating black hole in quantum mechanical model. So here, so we have pure state. So this is the whole system. And uh, okay, so we okay, suppose that this state uh, is a bipartite system of the black hole, black hole and uh, Hawking radiation. So here, psi i, is uh, uh, represent some black hole microstates. So I runs from one to K and uh, this system, so radiation system uh, describes the Hawking radiation particles. So basically, so we can, we, we can measure the Hawking radiation just by looking at the, the uh, entanglement entropy respect to this system, so our system. So this is the generic model, but okay, here, the end of the world brain model uh, means that uh, basically we identify these black hole microstates uh, with so-called the end of the world brain. Okay, so basically we have uh, some 2D gravity. So it, it is also the JT gravity coupled to some brain with some tension mu. And this brain is called the end of the world brain. So the idea is that uh, Okay, so now, so okay, we have say, yeah, k, k, k possible states for the black hole microstates, okay, k states. And uh, uh, actually, end of the world brain uh, can take, um, take uh, k states, get okay, by i, so the same index. So, uh, namely, so okay, once you pick up one state here, so psi i times uh, i. Then you identify these states with some Euclidean path integral configuration uh, with end of the world brain. Okay. 
So this, this Euclidean uh, path integral uh, describes this state. So this is uh, uh, the model. And in Lorentzian signature, so this Euclidean configuration corresponds to some black hole. OK, this is a kind of toy black hole with horizon. So and the end of the world brain is inside the horizon here. So we, we don't see the end of the world brain directly from uh, outside observer, uh, but we, we, we can um, measure uh, the existence of the end of the world brain by just calculating the entanglement entropy from the boundary. Okay, so th this one is inside the horizon. So, and it describes black, black hole microstates. So this is the model, and this is very simple to use. So in this model, so interestingly, so, okay, you, you can calculate a, say, the reduced entry matrix very simply. So this is the reduced entry matrix for the radiation system. I just take a, a trace, partial trace, and then you end up with this guy. Here, so you have an overlap between psi i and psi j. And in this model, okay, so this inner product can be given by just a gravitational okay, path integral on some hyperbolic disk okay, here. So this curve is a, a boundary. So it's the same boundary as here. And you also have a uh, um, end of the world brain, but IJ indices uh, runs along the brain. But here you only have one, one brain. So these two indices must be the same. Otherwise it vanishes. So you have a chronic delta and uh, this gravitational path integral. So, so here, so JT gravity is uh, living on this hyperbolic disk. And this path integral gives you some number. Uh, what we call Z1. Okay, so this is the, the inner product, but uh, you, you can calculate the square of them, okay? And the square gives you somewhat interesting configuration in the gravity. Okay, now, now let's move on to the, uh, this guy. So naively, so you just take a square, scale of this guy, so you, all, you would get uh, this configuration. So you just have two copies of these, okay? But, okay, so I, I didn't explain the detail, but uh, this gravity region, okay, so this region is fixed just by uh, kind of dynamically. So we impose a boundary condition along the asymptotic boundary of this space time. So, and then so, okay, we, we, we give some information about along this curve. Then uh, the, the JT gravity automatically fills in uh, this region. Okay. So okay, I, I mean that. Okay. So now we we have we we only have these curves as a boundary. Okay. But then there are two types of uh, configuration. Two two configurations. So one is the con disconnected one. But there are actually there is a, um, another configuration, so which bounds a uh, which bound these like this. Okay, this is one more configuration. So this is asymptotic boundary, and they are disconnected. But the, the gravity can connect these two asymptotic boundaries like this. So this is nothing but a wormhole connecting to uh, disconnected boundaries. Okay, so there can be two configurations. So the, the, the first one gives you Z1 squared, okay? Because you uh, have two copies of this guy. But the second one is new. So it, it, it describes the one whole solution and uh, we call it Z2 because it, it has uh, two asymptotic boundary you know, connected to each other. And you can play the same game for for uh, yeah for calculating say the trace of the n power of rho, rho r okay so you can remember the same game for say n equals three case so now you, we have three asymptotic boundaries the 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 first configuration you you would come up with is just the three disconnected geometry 
Okay, so this is fully disconnected geometry. But the, the, you, you can yeah, partially connect these two asymptotic boundaries just using one whole solution. So, so this is the, this one. This is partially connected geometry. So two asymptotic boundaries are, are connected by one hole. So this is the one hole. And of course, you have fully connected geometry. So three asymptotic boundaries are connected by uh, the one hole solution. So uh, typically, so the trace of row to the end uh, is just given by the sum of all these configurations. So this is the kind of result, uh, but and I, I'm, I'm using some approximation. But anyway, so, okay. Uh, okay, now you, you see that in the case of n equal three, so you have three, three different configurations and you need to sum all of them to calculate the gravitational path integral. So then, so you see that, the, okay, now you identify the dimension of the radiation system as a, as a time. Okay, so this is now regarded as a time of the black hole, black hole evaporation. So then, okay, so log k is plays a role of time and at the early time, when k is very small, Okay, then the fully disconnected solution actually dominates. Okay, if you look at carefully, uh, then this term, this term actually dominates. Then at R time, so you get the log k behavior. So namely, so entropy is proportional to the time of the uh, black hole evaporation. On the other hand, if you go to the late, late time, then the fully connected solution dominates then you get some number. So uh, at the early time, you get the linear growth, but at the late time, you have some saturation. So, so this one, this curve is uh, now uh, reproducing the page curve for the radiating black hole. But of course, this is approximation. So we only have early time behavior and late time behavior, so, but there are many contributions from partly connected one holes. So once you take into account these contributions into account, then the curve becomes uh, smooth around the page time. But okay, so now so we should rely on some um, numerics to see more carefully about the, the behavior of the page curve. Okay, before that, okay, let, let me comment on the capacity. Okay, you can similarly uh, um, calculate the asymptotic behavior of the capacity at the early time and late time. And it turns out that at the early time, the capacity uh, behaves like this exponentially. So okay, it, it exponentially grows at the early time, but at the late time, it's saturated. So this is a typical behavior of the capacity. But of course, we don't know what happens around the page time from this argument. So we, we are not sure yeah, how they behave. Okay. It may be smooth or it may be divergent. So, so we, we want to look more carefully about the behavior of the capacity around page time. So but to this end, so we have to use some numerics. And we did some uh, numerical, uh, okay, this is very simple numerical calculation. And, which is originally done by uh, the original authors in the West Coast paper. Okay, so they, they picked up some micro canonical ensemble. Okay. But anyway, so you, you can do some computation uh, once you fix ensemble. So then, so, okay, this is the result for the entanglement entropy. So once you take into account the uh, partly connected replica hole contribution, then entanglement entropy becomes smooth. Okay, so it, it smoothly interpolates the linear growth part and the saturating part. So this is the curve. So you can similarly calculate the capacity numerically. So then so the capacity has a peak uh, exactly at the page time. So this is the page time. Actually, so once you include a, the, uh, the partly connected replica one hole, then there is no sharp um, um, page time here, okay? So 
you, you cannot tell where is the page time from this figure because it's smooth. But if you look at the capacity, you see a clear peak. So yeah, actually, your capacity is uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to use the capacity to look to fix the page time clearly. This is a microcanonical ensemble, and actually, uh, the, in the original paper, so there is a computation using canonical ensemble, and we did the same same computation, and uh, we get the, mostly the same result. Um, so in the canonical case, so the entanglement density behaves almost the same as in the microcanonical ensemble, but the capacity shows slightly uh, different behavior. So uh, namely, so we found some a slight bump, so some, some peak and bump here. And we, we change the parameter uh, slightly. And then, yeah, in any case, yeah, even in the canonical case, okay, we find some peak, nice peak, and it goes to, uh, it approaches to some constant value. Actually, the canonical ensemble is more natural um, when you want to regard this system as a black hole, because in the canonical case, um, at, at the late times, so the capacity actually saturates to the thermal value. Okay, but okay, there are yeah, not so significant difference between canonical and microcanonical. In, in in either case, so we see some sharp peak around page time. So okay, so this is uh, the end of my talk, and uh, okay, let me summarize. Okay, so in in, uh, in this talk, so I I hope that I can con convince you that the capacity of entanglement can be a good probe of Hawking radiation. So uh, from the capacity formula into the electron gravity, so we we kind of speculate that there must be some discontinuity at the page time. And in the end of the world brain model, then we, we can also take into account the, the partly connected replica wormhole configurations. And then, so the peak uh, or discontinuity becomes uh, a peak or crossover, but still, yeah, it shows some, yeah, yeah, the capacity of entanglement, we actually approve the Hawking radiation or the formation of the replica lampo. Okay, as a future problem, so we don't, we don't know how to derive the similar uh, capacity formula in higher dimensions or in more general setup, including say higher derivative contributions. And also, yeah, unfortunately, we cannot um, apply our formula to say more realistic black holes. Um, we, we studied several examples, but uh, uh, actually, the, our formula is very hard to use because we have a derivative of the Dirton respect to uh, n. And to calculate this guy uh, requires knowing the replica geometry. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to use. So we hope to yeah, apply our formula to more rigorous block calls to see uh, if our speculation is correct in general. Okay, so this is at the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tatsuma. Thank you. So thanks, Tatsuma, for, for a wonderfully clear talk. Um, we had a bunch of questions, mostly for me, <laughs> in the in the in the seminar itself. I, I have a bunch more, but um, let me see if anybody else has any questions. Okay, if not, I'm going to take the opportunity and 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 keep asking questions. Um, so I, I, it's great talk, and I, and 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 it really helped clear up a lot of things in your in your paper for me. Um, I have a I have a couple more questions though. Do you know? Uh, okay, so so staying in two dimensions. Do you know what happens um, with with um, uh, something like CGHS? Did you guys um, study that as well? Actually, yeah, we we okay. Um, we didn't study the, the, any black hole in CGHS case, but uh, I think the the behavior should be the similar. Okay. Similar to the JT case, yeah. Okay. Uh, but are you interested in the asymptotic flat black hole? 
for I am, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what happens in this. Okay, so, so CGHS is a variant of, of, I guess, a variant of JT gravity in the sense that it's it's asymptotically yes. flat, whereas JT has asymptotically ADS um, conditions. So, so, so if you go to the JT action and you replace um the phi times r minus two with phi r minus two um then you get uh then you get this 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 variant right it's actually a variant that was or, or that was well okay so it's from the string theory side it, it comes from cghs but there's a there's a there's a kind of variant that was discovered and studied by by jockey and his and his uh, one of his uh, students kagami um, um, and it has a supersymmetric version, and 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 it has a lot of the properties of of um, of JT gravity, except that it's it's asymptotically flat. And you know, given that Maldacena and oh, I can't remember who who else was in that paper, but there's a there's a uh, maybe it was Douglas Stanford um, um, have studied a lot of okay so in, in two dimensions ads ds the the algebra is the same and so uh, you know you would expect a lot of the physics to be uh, the the same as well um and then you have this in between the the positive curvature uh, positive cosmological constant negative cosmological constant you have this set of measure zero of asymptotically flat um uh, boundary condition and, and i'm curious as to how much of the understanding of what happens in JT gravity, you know, for example, JT gravity as a matrix, as a matrix model, and, and uh, the page curve and Hawking radiation and all of these things that we understand um, in the last couple of years for JT gravity. I'm, I'm curious as to how much of this um, goes through in the asymptotically flat um, condition. So that's why I'm, I'm, I was interested in this. Um, and then I, I, I tried to convince. I tried to convince Edward Witten that this was an interesting thing to think about as well, um, and in particular, his um, in his uh, series of papers on deformations of of uh, JT gravity. So, for a particular set of super for a particular class of superpotentials in, in in Witten's deformations of JT gravity, I think you can also get the same asymptotically flat boundary condition. But the problem is that um, you'd have to find a way to to so ADS boundary conditions are great because these conical singularities that that were key in his computation could be localized in the in the bulk, um, and uh, because of the the ADS uh, behavior, but you can't do that in in asymptotically flat boundary conditions anymore, and and uh, we couldn't find a way to 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 do it in a sensible way. In, in this CGHS, but I, I'm curious as to how much of you know your your story goes through for for CGHS um, or, or something similar to CGHS. Um, so that was the first yeah. question. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Our, our yes, our result actually holds for yeah, even for the asymptotically asymptotically flat black holes like a CGHS case. Um, but for, formally. Formally, you know, it holds, but in practice, it's it's not so clear what happens because okay, um, yeah, the formula itself is valid for general two-dimensional gravity, zero-atom gravity, but uh, in in calculation, um, there are huge differences between asymptotic ADS case and uh, say the sitter or asymptotic flat case, okay. Mm -hmm. It is because in the in the case of ADS2, okay, ADS case, so we prepare, we couple some so-called flat beds to the ADS boundary. Mm -hmm. So we, we couple extra space time um, to set up the radiation region. But in the case of say flat uh, asymptotic flat black hole, so there is no yeah, no need to couple the uh, flat beds. We all yeah, we already have a flat the best region in CGS black holes. Right. So yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very huge difference. And if also in the Zeta case, you don't have to couple the heat best. And actually, that's uh, actually nice in, in some sense, because once you couple uh, the heat bus, flat the bus system to ADS, 
then you have to yeah, make sure that the boundary condition is smooth along the interface. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's actually called some problem called the conformal welding problem. You have to solve some yeah, technical complicated problem to, to get the uh, uh, entanglement entropy correctly. But uh, in the case of the sitter or CGH case, there is no need to include conformal welding problem. So that's a uh, one a good point of thinking about the non ages case cases. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, yeah, actually, I, I'm not so 100% sure. But uh, the the proof of the iron formula is only done for ages two case. Mm -hmm in my understanding and formally formally the the derivation looks the same even for non ads cases but uh, yeah once you go to the tositer or flat, flat space uh in this uh flat space black holes then yeah the formula is not claimed to hold so far so is it possible? Would it, would it be a sensible thing to to a sensible way to approach the flat space case by taking by taking a, a, a cosmological constant by by picking a negative cosmological constant um, as a regulator? So so imagine you you start off you you add negative cosmological constant, but instead of having lambda equals minus two, you have lambda you analytically continue that and you send, uh, you know, you eventually send lambda to zero. Do you know what happens in that case? Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the point. Yes. Yeah. Once you have a cosmological constant, negative cosmological constant, you have natural boundary. So, where you, yeah. you can impose some bound, sensible boundary condition for the direction. Yeah. And then, actually, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. Well, right. Yeah, you have natural boundary condition for the direction, but in the case of the sitter or uh, asymptotic flat black holes, um, then there is no sensible, okay, no no natural boundary conditions for the direction, which makes the analysis more kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. And actually, well, okay, another yeah, good point for the ADS is that uh, you can use a Schwarzian picture. You have a Schwarzian action mm -hmm. uh, describing the, the direction. Mm -hmm. And you can use such a uh, short young action to derive the, the, the island formula. That's another yeah, advantage of using this too. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, uh, there, there are several works uh, studying. Okay, okay. Once you believe in the island formula, you can study many, many black holes other than ADS2 cases. And there are many papers right. studying, say, asymptotic right. flux. In black holes and also in uh, the sitter black holes. Right. Okay, like, uh, maybe you know that uh, Tomonori is so amazing. He also has uh, studied uh, several the black holes. And uh, he also has some nice derivation without using a gravitational, uh, okay, without, um, right. He, he has some nice tricks to deal with the uh, sitter case yeah, in his paper. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the second question that I have is, is a more general question about capacity of entanglement in, in, in general. Um, so I, I think I agree that it's, an, that it's an interesting probe of, of Hawking radiation. And I wonder if the statement can be made that it's an interesting probe of just general interacting quantum systems in, in, in open quantum systems. Um, right, right, right. You know, so the, so the point with the, with, the, with the page curve, I guess, mm -hmm. is that, you, you know, once you're, once you're if you have some some quantum system that's interacting with the thermal bath, once once it's sufficiently into the thermal bath, <clears throat> then you get the then you, you, know, you turn around in the in the entanglement. And I wonder that if there's if there's some statement to be well, I, 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 there probably is right. But you, as you say, it's it's not a quantity that's that's very popular, I guess. Um, you know, the, the capacity of entanglement, uh, but I wonder if the statement can can be made that, you know, that if I have some generic open quantum system, um, then there there is this phase, there is this first order phase transition, um, 
you know, once one sufficient one sufficient, I guess, information has been leaked into the thermal bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the capacity should be used for for such young yeah, parcel of page transition cases. But okay, here the point is that okay, so th this one is associated with the replica parameter, so not say temperature. So we, we took a derivative respect to the replica parameter. Yeah. So we need some replica, yeah, trick or yeah. So but uh, yeah, that, that, that yeah, actually yeah, the nice thing is that okay, naively, so you you would expect that okay, so this is the page curve, and if you take a derivative respect to this page time, you would get some yeah this continuity. This is a kind of similar to the thermodynamic uh, phase transitions. So, so where the T is now replaced with the temperature, for instance. Mm -hmm. But the, what is different for the capacity of entanglement is that we not we are not taking the derivative respect to time, but uh, we just uh, we take a derivative respect to the re replica parameter n. So there are um, how can I say? There are some different, okay, so you, you would map the entanglement entropy or capacity in three dimensions. So one is one direction is parameters by page time, T, and here we have a parameter N. This is my kind of picture. So, and the page curve is written at N equal to one, and the capacity, capacity calculates some, okay, with respect to this direction. Yeah, but uh, we fix the derivative uh, at n equal to one. So, so it's it's a kind of orthogonal direction. Right, right. No, but I, I mean, for example, mm -hmm. the more general statement of your analogy between thermodynamics and um, and 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 I guess the replica trick um, with with n analytically continued and identified as as the temper as the inverse temperature, right? <clears throat> so the point is that if I, if I give you some system and you can write down an entanglement and you can write down a modular Hamiltonian for it, um, then you can just pretend that that modular yeah. Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian for some quantum system um, and just oh, yeah, yeah, use yeah. physical mechanics mm -hmm. with that Hamiltonian, right? Um, yeah. And I guess one, one, one approach for taking this seriously in a quantum many-body system was, was proposed by uh, Lee and Haldane. I don't know if you're familiar with the work on... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, entanglement uh, spectrum. Yeah. Entanglement spectrum, right? So that 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 that's that very specifically works with the modular Hamiltonian, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I ask because um, you know there, there there are some really neat things that you can do. So with a student of mine, um, we're, we're currently working on a problem of using um, neural networks to train uh, using a neural network to to diagnose a uh, many body localization uh, ergodic transition in a in a in a many body system just in generic many body systems um, uh, and it's kind of a little bit related to the talk that I gave at strings I don't know if you if you um, heard that it was on quantum batteries um, but these quantum batteries are, are quantum systems that you couple to a, to, a, to a heat bath for example only you're not interested in information flowing out of the system. You're interested just in energy flowing out of the system and energy per unit time. So the the, the ability to charge or discharge the system, at a, uh, you know, is the key resource um, in that the key quantum resource in that in that kind of problem. And one of the things that's that's key is well, one of the things that that's that's emerged is that you know if you take some say some two level quantum system, some qubit system, right? And, and you you know charging that is basically just flipping the the the, cu the qubit, and then you take you take let's say n of these qubits and you couple them together, right? And you get an n qubit um, chain, and you can compute the the energy the the work done on that system um, when you couple it to a, to an external bath, um, and then you can compare what happens if you take that same system and then instead of just coupling the the instead of just having n parallel batteries you entangle the batteries right and there you can derive a bound on 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 how much information uh, oh sorry on how much energy you can extract from that system and it turns out that that the energy that you can extract from the from the entangled system is 
more than the energy from just having n of these things lined up in parallel. So parallel, um, you know, parallel batteries um, uh, produce less energy than than entangled batteries. Okay, but there's but but there's also a bound on how much power you can uh, you can hope to 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 extract from the system. And the bound is the bound depends on the entanglement of the of the system. And so, you know, one of the reasons for for asking you to speak um, is I wanted to learn whether this was in some way related to the capacity of entanglement of the system. So, if I have a system that has a high capacity of entanglement, oh. then perhaps then perhaps the ability to entangle more and more of the system um, mm -hmm. is it, it, it is related to how much energy or power I can extract from 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 such quantum systems. Oh. Um, and this would be a statement about just generic finite dimensional systems, right? Um, oh, right, okay. Right. So uh, I started telling you about the the, the project that count. So so there, you need some you need some way of training this neural network, um, and and the way we train the neural network is on the um, entanglement spectrum. In fact, um, mm -hmm. so the modular Hamiltonian there. So given some some quantum system with a Hamiltonian. You compute the modular Hamiltonian, uh, modular Hamiltonian, you diagonalize it, and you read off the, the spectrum of the modular Hamiltonian. And then you use that spectrum to train the neural network. Um, and once you've trained a neural network on something like a Heisenberg spin chain, it turns out that it's incredibly versatile. And you can use the same neural network to say things about a whole bunch of other systems um, without retraining it. So the modular Hamiltonian is, in some way, you know, sufficient information to 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 probe more than just simple systems. So uh, let me let me rephrase that. The modular Hamiltonian for a simple system like a just a nearest neighbor spin chain somehow codes enough information about such problems that you can take that same neural network trained on that very simple system and extend it to like a chaotic system and it'll still tell you things about um uh, still tell you useful things about the system it seems that's kind of what we're what we're seeing uh -huh. and i wonder you know you know how much well okay I, I wonder how far your analogy can be pushed and put it that way you know i have no idea so in, in the case of say quantum field theory or quantum universe systems the capacity of entanglement is has has been not so well well uh, well studied so far. Mm. So it was introduced ten about ten years ago, but uh, there are only a couple of works uh, directly study its properties in QFT. So, so actually, yeah, I, I don't know much about say so what kind of constraint or inequalities it satisfies. Yeah. So entanglement entropy is known to satisfy say strong subadditivity. So that is yeah. one of the most yeah. strongest form of the yeah, constraints yeah. Uh, imposed on the entanglement entropy. But once you go to say Rémy entropies, then there are less inequalities known so far. And in the case of capacity, to my best knowledge, there is no known constraint or bounds. So yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. So yeah, what, what's yeah what you can learn uh, from the say say yeah, maybe you you want to constrain the cap properties of capacity just using unitarity of your system, right? So yeah, that's yeah, that's a very interesting problem. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. It was a good seeing you again. Oh yeah, yeah. thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, maybe uh, one day when 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 people can travel internationally again, we can invite mm -hmm. you back to Cape Town. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I didn't know that you were working on neural network. Uh, yeah. So I have, to, I have two. I have two problems that I'm, mm -hmm. that I'm you know thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, 